In the late 1800s, physicists were working to mathematically describe something called the black body spectrum. Above absolute zero, every molecule and atom in an object are wiggling around. As they wiggle, they emit radiation in the form of electromagnetic waves. Faster wiggles release shorter wavelengths, and slower wiggles release longer wavelengths. A collection of particles will release a mixture of wavelengths that's dependent on the temperature of the object they make up. This is because temperature is a measure of how quickly, on average, all of the particles in an object are moving. At the time, they were using something called equipartition theorem to figure out what sort of radiation should be coming out of an object at a given temperature. The idea was that particles wiggle in every way that it's possible to wiggle, and the energy is distributed amongst all of the wiggling variations. These wiggles are also called energy states. This works really well at low temperatures, but as you approach temperatures above a few hundred degrees, the theorem totally stopped working. It gave an answer that was literally infinitely too high. This was because the theorem assumed that there was no minimum energy state, that particles wiggles could always be a bit smaller. When they went to distribute the energy among all of the possible states, too much energy ended up in those infinitely small wiggles. This was obviously far off from what was measured, so they knew that something was wrong, but nobody really knew why. Then, in 1900, Max Planck figured out the solution. In a moment of frustration, he decided to see what would happen if instead of infinite states, there was some minimum, and all of the other energy states were just a multiple of this minimum. And it worked. What went on to be called the Planck Law was able to correctly predict the black body spectrum even at really high temperatures. And that minimum energy is now called the Planck Constant. What Planck didn't know at the time was just how pervasive this odd little number was. His discovery paved the way for the quantum revolution, and that constant shows up all throughout quantum theory. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the de Broglie wavelength, Schrodinger's equation, even the Dirac equation all use Planck's constant or the reduced Planck's constant. When Planck first used the constant, he didn't actually think it would exist as a physical number, and assumed it would have a value of zero. This would mean that the infinite states were still possible. But it has been measured many times experimentally to be non-zero, meaning there is actually a minimum energy. If you'd like to learn more about Planck's constant and the aftermath of its discovery, I'd suggest checking out Spacetime's video, as it does a great job of explaining all of this. So, how do we measure Planck's constant? Well, thanks to Einstein, we know that the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the electromagnetic wave. So the higher the frequency, the more energy is required to produce that photon. To determine Planck's constant, we're going to need to measure the energy of a photon and its wavelength. Let's tackle measuring the energy first. We're going to need some light emitting devices, specifically a few different LEDs. Because of the way LEDs are made, they require a minimum amount of energy to produce a photon of a particular wavelength. In this case, the energy is in the form of voltage applied across the LED. Below what we'll call the threshold voltage, the LED doesn't have enough energy to start producing photons. But right as we pass that threshold, light starts to come out. On the visible spectrum, red light is a much longer wavelength than green light. Longer wavelengths are lower frequency, so it requires less energy to produce red light than it does to produce green light. For this reason, you can see that as I turn up the voltage, the LEDs light up in sequence based on their wavelength. So to determine the energy of a photon coming from each LED, all we need to know is what that threshold voltage is for each. The setup to measure this is actually quite simple. I've got a variable power supply that I've connected to one LED. I also have a multimeter set to read DC volts across the legs of the LED for more accurate measurement. It's also a good idea to add a 100 ohm resistor in series, but if you're careful, this isn't strictly necessary. Now the voltage can slowly be turned up until the LED just starts to emit light. My camera can't pick this moment up really well, but it's really easy to see in person. Record the voltage and repeat this for every LED. Now with our energy measured, we need to know the frequency of light each LED is producing. To figure this out, we'll be using a diffraction grating. A diffraction grating is a piece of plastic that has small lines cut into it that each act like a prism. In my case, there's a thousand lines per millimeter of plastic. These small cuts cause the lights to refract and spread. Just like a prism, if we shine white light on it, we'll get a rainbow. This is the setup we'll be using. First, we have a screen which we'll be projecting our light onto. Here I'm just using my notebook, and I've added a centimeter scale ruler to help make measurement easier. Then we have a diffraction grating, which I'm using a clamp to hold. 
The distance between the diffraction grating and the screen are very important, so be sure to get an accurate measurement of the distance with a ruler. To measure the wavelength of light using this setup, we need to shine a beam of light through the diffraction grating and onto the screen. For monochromatic light, or light that is just one color, we'll see a spot on the screen in the middle where the light isn't diffracted, and a series of spots at regular intervals on either side where the light is diffracted. For white light, we'll see a white spot in the middle and a rainbow on either side. We'll be using the distance of the outside spot to the center to determine the angle between the center and outer images. This angle and the distance between the individual lines of the diffraction grating can be used to determine the wavelength. First, to see how this works, let's use a laser so it's perfectly monochromatic and the wavelength is well known. When the laser is turned on, three dots appear on the screen. If we were to use a bigger screen and project the image further, we would actually see another pair of dots. The center dot is called the zero-order image, and the outer dots are the first-order image. More pairs of dots would be called the second, third, and so on. Make a mark on the page to show where the first-order image is, and then measure the distance from this point to the center where the zero-order image is. To determine the wavelength using this measurement, we're going to use the formula d sine theta is equal to m lambda. To find theta, we use the inverse tan function on a scientific calculator, along with the distance to the screen and the deflection that we just measured. For our laser, this gives us an angle of 33 degrees. Plugging this into our equation, along with 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters for d, gives us a wavelength of 540 nanometers. This laser is actually rated for 532 nanometers, but our measurement is pretty close. Now that we know how the maths work, let's try this again, but this time with our LEDs. Since LEDs don't put out a coherent beam, we need to make a collimator. I'm just using a piece of cardboard that I've cut a hole in, and covered with electrical tape to form a small slit. Placing this in front of the LED produces a thin beam line. To help calibrate things, I used a white LED first, which gave a nice rainbow. Then I marked approximately where the four colors that I'll be looking for are. This way, if my colored LED measurements look far off from these, I'll know that something has gone wrong. With that done, I replaced the white LED with the first color, red. Just like the laser, three stripes showed up on the number line. I marked where these lines are and then repeated this for the other LEDs, making sure to carefully put everything back to exactly the same place to minimize error. Here's my results after all of the measurements. The lines from each LED are very close to the rainbow control lines that I added earlier. Now we can repeat the maths we did earlier to determine the wavelength of each LED. Here I've put them into a table next to the voltages we measured earlier. We now have everything we'll need to calculate Planck's constant. The Planck-Einstein relation is written in the form of frequency and energy, so we need to convert our voltage measurements and rearrange things a bit. To determine the energy, we take our voltage measurement and multiply it by the elementary charge constant, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. Calculate the energy of each LED, and then start plugging things in. Solve for Planck's constant for each LED, then take an average of these values. My final value came out to 5.3 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, which is only 12% off from the actual value. While this experiment may seem like a high school science fair project, measuring Planck's constant is actually a really big deal. As you saw, much of our mathematics rely on this constant, and without an accurate measure, much of our modern society that is based on the principles of quantum mechanics would stop working. In a future video, we'll be exploring how modern scientists measure Planck's constant, and build an extremely accurate scale called a watt balance. Also, many of the skills that we've covered in this video, from collimating light into beams, to splitting it with a grating, and carefully measuring it, will be used in future videos to build things like spectrophotometers, or to analyze the light from distant stars. So be sure to check back every other Monday for all of that.